Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with Jordanian-born American writer and political activist Suhair Hamad. Uh, you, you were published at 22, but uh, I wonder when you first realized you could, you could actually write. When did it really come out to you, you know, in your, in your own recognition? Because uh, I was such a nerd and a reader. And so I would read books. I always feel like my favorite writers are readers. You know, when you do the research about their lives and stuff, you find that they actually love. love the text as well. So there was something about my brain at seven, eight, nine. First of all, I would always look for, t I don't know how I found Edgar Allan Poe. It wasn't like my teacher put him in front of me. I don't know how I found Tennessee Williams. I decided to do a book report on Tennessee Williams in the seventh grade, and my teacher had to write a note to my mom. And she said, do you realize who your daughter is writing about? Because the, it wasn't expected, first of all, from where I grew up, and then it wasn't expected from where I came from, two different places, right? Um, so I always go back to the love of reading as the gestation of the writer's life. I just really, I, I can't separate them. Well, you were spotted by the godfather of uh, hip-hop, Russell Simmons, uh, for his HBO channel's uh, Deaf uh, Poetry Jam. What kind of turning point was that in your life? Do you know that story? Did Russell tell you that story? Because it's... The, um, you know, like, uh, when they were first filming the, the series, they, ex they said, we wanted to film Suhair Hamad. Suhair Hamad, could you please send us a reel of your work? And I didn't have a reel. I, didn't ha I was a poet. I, had, I could fax you a poem. So I didn't get picked, because everyone who got picked, that was September 2001. They were filming. They had, filmed, they had come from California to film in New York. And September 11th happened. Everyone went home. They filmed, they scheduled to film again, only a month and a half later. And I wrote first writing since a week after September 11th, 2001, in New York. And uh, I sent it to 50 friends. By the time I was on HBO, it had been translated into 12 languages. It had been published in dozens of journals. And it had gone around the world because people needed to hear something from America that wasn't vengeful. Now, in terms of um, going back to the, your roots, your Palestinian roots, is it hard in the world in which you live now to, to connect with those roots? Are you able to maintain that connection? I think so. Um, there's something I love about being in Palestine that I can't explain. There's something about the quality of the sun on my skin that I love and I feel is ancient and um, is with me somehow. I read a lot. I ask a lot of questions. I, uh, I, I try to watch Palestinian media and I try to ask Palestinians of different social classes what they think about every situation because there isn't a monolithic experience even in Ramallah. Mm -hmm. You can be in Ramallah and live in a bubble and you can be in Ramallah and never enter a restaurant. And I, I just try to ask people how their lives are to, under, to maintain that connection. So to what extent is there pressure on you as your fame grows to, to keep the Palestinian agenda, the issue, up there, to, to be a representative? I don't think it's pressure because it's not going away. And I've never, I, again, I don't uh, distinguish it. I don't think there could be a free Palestine if there isn't a free Cuba or if there isn't a free South Africa. Like, I really do feel it's connected emotionally and now as we see in the world financially as well. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, there won't ever be a day that one does not work for social justice. And, of course, you start where you are. Do you feel America is starting to listen? Do you think America's mood is changing with the first black president, with a change in, in sort of uh, administration? Do you think there's, a, there's a, a greater willingness to listen to issues such as the Palestinian cause? I think there's a greater willingness to look like we are, and I think that's the start. I'm happy for that start. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think the shift, I haven't felt it to be as seismic as is reported. You know, in New York City in the past month, or in New York State in the past month, we've had three Latin American men killed in the street, beaten to death for, be, for being thought of that they were Mexican. I think they weren't even Mexican, any of them. This isn't getting news, but this is, yeah, I went to do uh, Clinton DeWitt High School, where James Baldwin went to school, a week after the election. And so I walked in and I said to the kids, so racism is over. They said it was worse. 12, 13, 14-year-old kids. They were like, no, like, you know, they're like, are you joking? What are you talking about? I was like, so tell, tell me. And yeah, so the, the appearance is there and maybe form will, fa will, form will follow fashion. Let's hope.
It's interesting. It's a, a backlash um, because of the, because of a black president backlash uh, through the, on the issue of racism. On the issue of feminism, do you think there's been a backlash uh, with some women saying, "Okay, enough is enough"? You know, we've we've created too many divisions. Or is there anything like? That, are you, you think? thinking of Sarah Palin right now? <laughs> Not I mean, there, there are know. there are phenomenons that are backlashes. I mean, the fact that Sarah Palin. Uh, could be represented as the ultimate feminist uh, icon. Um, it's, it's, again, it says something about what appears to be changing and what is really changing. So for me, I, it would never mattered. I mean, of course, you want to see a black president, you want to see a woman president. I would love to see a Native American president, actually, if we were going to go into the order of representation. Um, but act I, would, I would be much more interested, and I'm glad for our president, in an intelligent, engaged president. And I think that's the, you know, that's the point. It says a lot about America, you know, who we think is cute and how. <laughs> The interesting when. thing is your, your work has allowed you to, to travel across the world now yeah. uh, and experience it? it more. How, yeah, how is it broadening your horizons? What do you think you're getting out of that now? I never thought I was going to leave Brooklyn. I, like, I remember, and my parents were very strict, and my, the street was wild, so we literally never went outside. I mean, the nerd fascination with books was, was kind of my situation. I remember, like, uh, always pressing my, uh, my cheek against the window. It's not the, it's not the window sill. It's like the mesh, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And just pressing it so hard that it would imprint on me. But that was as far outside as I could go. And I have been everywhere I've wanted to go. And very importantly for me, Palestine was very important to go. And there, are place, there are other places I want to go, but you know what I realized was like, and I've gone with my poetry, and I've gone without diluting, and not only not diluting a political perspective, but allowing my political perspective to change. I mean, how could I go to New Zealand and South Africa and Scotland in the same year and come back with the same politics? How, how old were you when you first got to see Palestine, to touch the soil? To I was 25. I was, it was half the lifetime of the state of Israel. Israel turned 50 and I turned 25. What was the emotion? I guess it was a rebirth in a way. And, I, and then maybe in that way, that first trip was very symbolic because I knew my grandparents died without returning to their homes. And um, in that, when I entered Ben-Gurion for the first time, the Israeli soldier with my American passport asked me where my grandfather was born. And I told her less than 30 miles from here. And she said, is he Israeli? I said, he's dead. And she said, uh, why did he leave? Who would leave? And I said, I don't know. He's dead. I never asked him. And I hated myself for that, in a way. Like, I had to find a truth, <laughs> which is the truth. But being put in that position, why did he leave? What answer <laughs> would you like to hear that is going to allow me in? And it's still like that. The, the, the times I've gone back, it's been like that. It, there seems to be a difference in the way people from 1948 are treated than people from 1967. I don't know why that is. There seems to be a threat to a narrative if you say you are from 1948 Palestine. And all of our refugees are from 1948 Palestine to a certain extent. How would you like to be remembered, Suhair? What would you like your legacy to be? I don't know yet. Not so I haven't decided all. yet. We'll wait to find out. Thank yeah. you very much for talking with me. Thank you very much.